Hey everybody, we're back with part four. Daryl's got a uh, misspelled thing up here. Obviously, he doesn't know what he's doing. I don't know what that says. <laughs> it's Latin. It's Latin. <laughs> it's Latin. Mm -hmm. Verbum, uh, verbum Domini Monad Aeternum, which is the motto of the Reformation. It means yeah. the word of the Lord endures forever. Oh, I've heard that before. Yes. There. Sometimes abbreviated VDMA. I've seen that too. So if you see this, the word these of, little yep. four compartments. Will Pastor Will we VDMA? That's the name of his uh, podcast. Yep. That's what that of, means. The word of the Lord endures forever. Yes. Okay, say it again in Latin. Uh, verbum Domini Monet Aeternum. Now, can you chant that like you're? I'll put <laughs> reverb on, and it'll sound like. <laughs> verbum Domini Monet Aeternum. There you go. Nice. <laughs> was that it? Was that a C you were hitting? There? I, I have no idea. <laughs> but anyway, I put that up there because I wanted to start talking about the canon of Scripture, and particularly in light of of us. Uh, before you go further, yep. some people may not be familiar with that word canon. Okay, yeah, I'm going to explain oh, that okay. in a minute. Uh, so, uh, in, especially in light of uh, some of the things that uh, a popular uh, preacher named Andy Stanley has said about not saying the Bible says, that you can't say the Bible says, because parts of the Bible may not be true and so on. So, uh, I wanted to just put that motto up there, because that was the motto of the Reformation. The word of the Lord endures forever. And of course, uh, Peter quotes it, and it comes from the Old Testament. Uh, All flesh is like grass, hmm. uh, and so on. Yeah. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Um, so I wanted to start out, uh, this word canon comes from a Greek word, kanon. And obviously canon comes directly from that. Yeah. The canon of scripture. That's an A. And the word kanon initially meant a reed, like a reed that grows in the, in the small. Oh, okay. And uh, then it, it got transferred into the idea of a measuring stick, because you can use a reed, cut off a certain length, and use it to measure. Yeah, but how do you know what and, the length uh, is? Well, like it could be whatever you want it to be. Huh. Uh, then, a, then a rule, or a ruler, and then a standard. So when we talk about the canon of Scripture, if you hear that term, what it's simply referring to is those documents which are considered a part of the, uh, and, and being the standard of what is the Word of God. So that anything outside of that uh, may be helpful, may be edifying in some ways, but it's not considered uh, inspired mm -hmm. from God. It's not the Word of God. Exactly. So that's, that's why I put that up there. There are some technical terms used in the New Testament that refer to the canon of Scripture. Uh, one of them is this Greek word, graphe, from which we get the word graph. Uh, obviously a graph is something written out, but, mm -hmm. but this just means a writing. But in the New Testament, it's used as a technical term for the Old Testament scriptures, just taken as a whole. So, for example, um, 2 Timothy 3.16, you may be familiar with that verse, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Scripture there is the word graphe. Okay. So, it's not, it's not uh, taken apart where he's not saying, well, Isaiah says this and Jeremiah says that. He's just including the entire Old Testament. All of the Hebrew scriptures would be included in all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Grafe. And at that point, during the time of Christ, <clears throat> the Old Testament was pretty well established as a yes. certain number of books, and it wasn't in dispute as to which ones were in or which ones were out. Pretty much. Um, there is a, a story which is disputed in on authenticity that there was, after the fall of Jerusalem, a council in a place called Jamnia, um, where some Jewish leaders got together and basically affirmed uh, the Hebrew Bible as we have it today. Now, there are some who say that that is just a myth. You're talking about in the year 70? After the year 70, yeah, yeah after, the fall. Late after the fall of Jerusalem. <clears throat> Whether that's true or not, we don't know, but... Uh, 
it's pretty clear from the Dead Sea Scrolls, which came from 150 some years before Christ, somewhere in that range, and the, the books that they copied that were considered scripture are mostly of the mostly the same books that we have in, in okay. the Hebrew Bible today. So and those were discovered in what the 1920s? 1947. Oh, 40s. The huh. year I was born. Oh, really? Yes. And it was a shepherd boy or something, right? Yeah, he threw a rock into a cave, and he heard a clank. Yeah. And he went to investigate, and his rock had hit a vase, and broken it, and in the vase and and other vases in the cave were these scrolls. That's just incredible. And he apparently, somehow they they ended up, or some of them ended up, at an antiquities dealer in uh, Jerusalem or some city near there, and then eventually got discovered by archaeologists, yeah. and then. They did some more looking around, and they found these. But basically what that did was <clears throat> all the people who said, we don't have anything that goes that far back, or what we have is not enough to really be confident, and all of a sudden, boom, you get this time capsule. That's right. That is matching up perfectly with all the books that we did have up to that point. Right. Yeah. So what happens is, of course, and, and if you've been around... Christianity and theology long enough, you'll always hear this from time to time, that uh, that the Bible has been copied and there's been so many years and it's all corrupted. And uh, there was a thought, particularly among more liberal scholars, that since the oldest copies of the Hebrew Bible we had came from 900, AD 900, uh, from a group of people called the Masoretes, uh, some Jewish copyists who, who preserved these, that uh, it possibly was corrupt because that's the oldest copies we hmm. had. And then, of course, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, that pushed it back a thousand years. Wow. And the, and the scroll of Isaiah that they found was virtually identical huh. to the copies they had from 900. So, huh. so that pretty much settled uh, the issue of the te textual fidelity of, okay. of the Old Testament. Um, so I just wanted to point out that this is a technical term used in the New Testament to refer to the entire, uh, scholars would say, the corpus or the body of the Old Testament yeah. text, all of them. Do you want to so, do you want to go into the idea of um, how we came to the canon as it is today, or is that too much? Sure. Of it? Yeah, I got I got another word I wanted to oh, share. Oh, okay, okay. And then yeah, we can do that. So the next word I wanted to is actually a verb. Gegraptai. And that's actually a, a past, present, or rather a present perfect, I should say, correct my description there, a present perfect uh, Greek verb, which means it stands written. Hmm. It has been written and it yeah. stands written. Uh, which is a way of saying that it was written in the past and what it was in the past, it stands today. Mm -hmm. And this is used to refer to quotations of Scripture in, in the New Testament. So, for example, when Jesus quoted Scripture to Satan in the wilderness temptation, yeah. uh, he prefaced his quotations with this word, huh. Gegraptai, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So, um, again, these, are, these two are, are technical terms which in common Greek could be used to refer to anything that was written, but in the yeah. New Testament, used specifically to refer to the, uh, to the Old Testament. Um, so one of the things that... Um, here it is right here. Uh, Matthew 4, uh -huh. verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 4. But he answered, it is written. Yes, and that's that word, gegraptai. Huh. It is written. It so, stands written. So it's actually... In Greek, it looks like just one word. It's, yeah, right. it's, it's just one word. Yeah. Huh. It's a present perfect verb. Do you know another one off the top of your head where that's used in the New uh, Testament? Yes, I've written some down here. Uh, Romans 3, 4 and 10. Romans 3, verse 4. 4 and verse 10. Um, I'll start with verse 3. What if some were unfaithful? Does their Romans three four? Is that what you've got? Yeah. Okay. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, 
though every one were a liar, as it is written. Yes, as it is written. That you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. And then, and then verse 10. Uh, I'll start with verse 9. What then, are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, written. Yes. none is righteous, no, not one. Mm -hmm. And there's other places in Romans, Galatians 4.27. Galatians 4.30, those are two other places where Paul uses it. Oh yeah, I see it right there. Um, For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. So it's a, it's a, another quote. And 4.30, same thing. Galatians 4.30. <clears throat> um, these numbers are so tiny. Oh, yeah. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So when it says, but what does the scripture say? That would be... Another use of that word in a different... Yeah, they may have... Uh, let me look that up. I don't know if they reworded it there. Hmm. Let me look it up here for sure. Galatians 4.30. Let me see what it says. I may That may be the other word, but uh, let me see. Galatians 4.30. Oh yeah, that's that's the use of graphe. Hmm. What does he graphe say? The scripture. Interesting. So uh, if if you've ever if you've ever heard Andy Stanley give his spiel about we can't say the Bible says, um, yeah. he he's really I mean it's kind of a word game. I, I don't know exactly his motives, but but the New Testament itself does that. Mm -hmm. That's the point I'm trying to make, <laughs> is that it does say the Scripture says, I had or a, uh, it is written. So, um, my favorite illustration of Andy Stanley <clears throat> is a guy on a tree branch sawing it off. <laughs> okay, about to tumble down. Yeah, you know. I mean, it's sad in a way because it, it doesn't matter. I mean, really, if if the whole collection of the 66 books we have in what we call the Holy Bible. If they're all inspired by God, it doesn't really matter if you say Matthew said or John said, or if you just simply say the scriptures say or the Bible says. It's the same thing. Yeah. So um, just, I mean, I just, I just don't see the need to, to play that kind of word, uh, word game, if you want to call it that. One of the interesting things um, about the Old Testament scriptures, the Jewish scribes and rabbis said something very interesting. They said if it was a book of scripture uh, that or in, in their day a scroll and they handled it, it defiled the hands. Now that's an interesting they said it defiled the hands. Hmm. What they meant by that was that the holiness and, and this, this points out the view, how they viewed these texts. The holiness of that scroll, being a scroll of God's word, that holiness transferred to the hands of anyone who handled it. So you had to wash your hands prior to handling it, hmm. so that you didn't you didn't get the defilement of what was your hands mixed up with the holiness of the text of God's word. And then you had to wash it your hands after you handled it so that the holiness of the scripture didn't get compromised by touching something profane. Isn't that interesting? So it's this set-apartness mm. yes. that's really being presented in that. Exactly. Yeah. It's, so, it's totally distinct from anything else on yes. earth. So if they handled, let's say, some text that might be written by somebody that they valued, but it wasn't part of the scriptures that wouldn't defile the hands. Right. So they didn't have to worry about washing their hands or anything. I mean, what the, what's, what's <clears throat> counterintuitive about that is you would think <clears throat> that they would say, hey, my hands are now very pure and holy because I handled the scriptures. Right. But they knew that their <clears throat> earthiness, their sinfulness, couldn't take what was holy and bring yes. it unto itself. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yes. So it actually does make sense. So, so when when you think about the Hebrew scriptures, they didn't call it the Old Testament, of course, the Hebrew scriptures or just the scriptures, uh, they they held them in such high esteem. 
that they would wash before and after handling hmm. them, just so that the holiness of them didn't somehow become corrupted or defiled in some way. Hmm. Um, which, which is, uh, and then of course with uh, <clears throat> uh, what else was I going to say here? Um, that's about all I was going to say on that topic. Now, as far as as the canon of uh, we say the collection, the canon of the Old Testament, basically the the Christian Church were originally comprised of converts from Judaism. Right. You know, Very all, early all on. of the apostles, uh, the early followers of Jesus, the hundred and twenty that were at Pentecost, yeah, who received the tongues of fire and spoke in other languages, they were all Jewish, and most of the people who who were originally converts at Pentecost, the 3,000 or, or however many, uh, it mentions 3,000, they were Jewish people from the dispersion, mm -hmm. from other countries. Because they were there to, yes, to be in Jerusalem. To celebrate Pentecost. They didn't know they were going to get uh, no. turned into the first Christians. So so all of these folks were uh, were Jewish converts to Christ. They They came to faith in Jesus as their Messiah. And Jesus himself, for example, uh, at the end of uh, Luke, where Jesus has risen, and then there are these two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus. Yeah, my, one of my favorite and, stories. And uh, Jesus incognito shows up and walks with them, and they don't know who he is. They don't recognize him. And they're, uh, they're telling him uh, what just happened with, uh, you know, Jesus being crucified, and some people say he's risen from the dead, and then he stays with them, and uh, and then he, they recognize him, and he ex he explains to them, they recognize him in the breaking of the bread, and he it, at one point I can't remember if it was while walking or after, he he explains to them uh, all the scriptures that talk about him. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm there. And right you can now. read the exact. I'm just paraphrasing here, but. Uh, <clears throat> this is at the end of Luke chapter 24. I'll start at verse 16. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. So this is when they're already on the road. Mm -hmm. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad, when one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying, they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Right. So there you have again, and there you have two things kind of combined. You have the prophets, Moses and the prophets. So there you have Moses would be the Genesis, Exodus, the first five books, the Torah as it was called. And then the prophets would be, you know, the prophetic books. And then they had other books. The rest of them they called the writings. So they had three divisions in the Hebrew Bible. Hmm. The Torah or the law, books of Moses, the prophets, and the writings. So those all comprised... Uh, the Hebrew Bible, the inspired uh, Word of God that we call the Old Testament, and so it's interesting there that Jesus, uh, that Jesus explained to them how all of those Moses and the prophets, in other words, the Old Testament as we know it today, explained about Himself. Mm -hmm. So, and and He says the same thing in John five, talking with the Pharisees. I don't have the exact verse written down. When he says, you, you search the scriptures daily. Yeah. Uh, or you search the scriptures because you think that you have eternal life in them. But they are they that testify of me. So, so again, it's this, it's this general term, the scriptures. 
and he says, they testify of me. So theologically, as we understand it today, as, as those who believe in Jesus as the Messiah and the Savior, that the Old Testament is about him as well. Mm -hmm. it, it prophesies him, it predicts him. It's that simple idea of the yes. Bible interpreting <clears throat> itself. Right, exactly. And, and you could even say God's word is interpreting God's word. Because Jesus right. is described as God's word, That's right. or as the word. And so here he is saying, what is the word about? It points to me. Uh -huh. Which would be an incredibly selfish thing to say if you weren't God himself. That's right. But if you are God, and he has yeah. given us his word, well, it would make total sense that he points to it as a reference. Yeah. It's like the greatest way of saying, I've given you this objective thing that explains who I am. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, so that you can have eternal life so that you can be forgiven of your sins. It's not just information so that you right. have this knowledge of me pure, right. purely just because it's, you know, interesting right. or because I want to I want to yeah. brag about myself. It's yeah. for your benefit that I will reveal myself to you. I don't have to, but I chose to. As the creator of the universe, here I am. I'm in the word. And so then for us to turn around and say, well, you know, the Bible isn't that important. Yeah. You well, know, I think if you if you continue reading beyond that verse, doesn't it say... Um, in 5? Yeah, no, in, in, in John 5. Doesn't it say, uh, but you refuse to come to me that you may have life? Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, isn't that what follows? Hang on. Um, this is interesting, too. The testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. Yes, he didn't do the work so that we would go, oh, I'm going to do the same thing. Yeah. yeah. What did you do? I'll do that. I'll do yeah. that and then some. Yes. Well, <laughs> one of the themes of John's gospel, interestingly, is the various witnesses to Jesus' validity. Hmm. So you have the scriptures, you have the works, you have the Father, huh. all bearing witness to Jesus. And then, of course, you have the Holy Spirit, which he explains in the Upper Room Discourse in John 14, 15, and 16 that will continue to bear witness to him after he's risen and after he's ascended. So, uh, you know, the scriptures will testify of me. Um, so that's one of the themes of John is the witnesses to Jesus. Um, I'm at the end of chapter 5. Oh, well, Do similar. not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me. Hmm. For he wrote of me. Yes. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Yes. So there you are again. Moses mm -hmm. wrote of me. So, uh, you know, we don't normally, Christians often, unfortunately, don't normally think of the Old Testament, Moses and the prophetic books. Maybe especially Moses. Maybe the prophetic books. We have the Christmas prophecies and so on that we yeah. always read. Don't normally think of the Old Testament as being about Jesus. But Jesus himself says... Unless, unless you're listening to Chris Roseboro. Yes. Which I know a lot of our listeners yes. do. And um, but that's what Jesus says that the Old Testament does, is testify of him. Um, which actually, yeah. a lot of what Jesus says is... Um, what's the word? I don't, I'm not sure confrontational is the right word, but it, it forces you to think about what does that mean? Why did he say mm -hmm. that? What is he getting mm -hmm. at? Mm -hmm. He doesn't give you a clear answer that's really yes. like dumbing things down. So when he says that Moses, uh, where's that exact quote? For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. Mm -hmm. he, he doesn't go into great detail. That's right. He's, he's challenging the listeners mm -hmm. to basically figure that out to an extent. Like, That's did, right. Did you really study that book or did you just yep. see in there what you wanted to see? Yep. But when God himself comes and says, no, that's about me and I'm here standing before you, it's incredibly challenging. It is. I, I don't know if I told the story before with you, but, you know, uh, this whole journey of me going from being a professional artist to now being a discernment blogger, content creator guy, mm -hmm. there's a number of steps about 10 or 12 years ago. And one of them was me, for a short time, I volunteered to be the youth group uh, leader guy at, at this uh, church plant we were a part of. And I just thought, you know, I'm going to just sit and read the Bible with these kids. And we're just going to talk. I don't want to play games and all that stuff. 
you know, they're too smart to fall for that. They're, mm. they're, it's too corny to have a curriculum and expect right. them to follow along with little pictures and stuff. I thought, let's just have an honest talk. And, and, and so if I, if I remember right, we went through Matthew, but it was one of the Gospels. And we just read through it, which I had not done for a long time. Because I'd been going to church where that was not practiced, mm. which is amazing. But the, the thing that really uh, jumped out at me was, man, Jesus didn't really... Um, pander to people he challenged people he said here's how it is and he kept going and he didn't turn around and say hey guys wait how come you're not following me please i'll, I'll rephrase that for you so it's easier to understand <laughs> he was he was kind of uh, um the opposite i guess of what i saw yes. in many of the churches where it was always dumbing things down, pandering, you know. Oh, you like movies? We'll do a series on movies. Oh, you mm -hmm. like you like sports? Oh, we'll talk about sports to get you to come and listen to stuff that's also supposed to be about God. Right. Jesus was the opposite of that. Yes. He was constantly challenging people. I'm sorry, I'm on a, I'm on a tangent now, but Yeah, well, the early the early Christians actually used I think it's Proverbs chapter 8, which talks about wisdom to refer to Christ. Huh. As the ultimate incarnation of wisdom and and um, and wisdom is talked about as if it were a person that's personified yes, yes. like uh, wisdom is like a person and wisdom laughs at your calamity yes well it, there, there is no so, real person in wisdom who's literally laughing at your calamity no, but no. but it's a way of saying wisdom is is way high above your foolishness and mm -hmm. your sinfulness yes and it's your own fault when you don't listen to what wisdom has to teach you that's right yeah so in in many ways and you pick this up from James. If you read the book of James, the book of James is kind of a uh, a takeoff on, on wisdom teaching, Jewish right. wisdom it teaching. Right, it sounds like an Old Testament yes, book. Yes, it does. So, um, continuing on this theme before we move on here, um, the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, was just the Hebrew Bible. And since the early Christians were Jews... And that was their Bible. And that, uh, as, as the New Testament and Jesus himself said, it testified of Jesus, that was their Bible. So uh, the, the Hebrew scriptures, the scrolls that uh, had Genesis through Malachi, uh, those scrolls, uh, that was their Bible. That's what they used. That's what, Paul, that's what Paul used. If you read the book of Acts, Paul went to the synagogues and yeah. he reasoned from the scriptures. And proving that Jesus was the Messiah. Apollos did the same thing uh, when you read about him in, in the book of Acts. So, so you have this, uh, this uh, Hebrew Bible that was used by the early Christians. And then um, in, the, in the time before Christ, maybe a hundred and some years, nobody knows for sure. Since there were so many Jewish people who no longer lived in, in uh, Israel... Uh, near Jerusalem and what we call Palestine today, but had been scattered throughout the Mediterranean world and spoke Greek. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some uh, people who got together and they translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek. Septuagint. And that's abbreviated LXX, so if you see that, yeah. that's the Roman numeral for 70. And the reason why they use that is because uh, tradition, which may or may not be true, says that 70 scholars did this translation. Oh, really? Yes. I've always seen that. I never and know what so it referred to. And so this is the Latin term, Septuagint. Did I say it right? Septuagint? Sep well, yeah, my my old New Testament professor said you were supposed to pronounce it Septuagint. Oh. But nobody does. Okay. <laughs> or is that an E? It's an E or an I. I don't remember. Okay. But uh, anyway, this is the Greek translation of the Old Testament scriptures. And so a lot of times... Like when Paul quotes the Old Testament, uh, it doesn't match up always with the Hebrew. So a lot of times he's probably using this. Oh, because, um, yeah, he quotes the Old Testament, but the words are yeah. a little bit different. Yes. The meaning is the yeah. same, but the words are a little so different. So I have a Septuagint um, Bible at home. Huh. So And, and sometimes it's maybe paraphrased a little bit, so it doesn't always go exactly word for word. And like today in our mm. world, English is the language that a lot of people have as a very uh, often used second language. Mm -hmm. And from what I understand, that was just what Greek was in that world. Yes. People would speak Aramaic, but they'd also speak Greek. Yes. Right? And so in the culture of Jesus' mm. time, 
they were using Greek a lot, which was perfect timing for it for the gospel to spread. Mm -hmm. If it had only been the the much smaller use of the language, it would be considered what uh, Aramaic or Hebrew. What were they? Well, called? Aramaic would have been the common language spoken, but of course, since the scriptures were written in Hebrew, which yeah. is a related language, yeah, it's a you know a Semitic language, um, and so Paul, for example, would have known Aramaic. So when it says in Acts toward the ends of end of Acts, when Paul is in the temple and there's this riot, uh, because there's a rumor that he brought a Gentile beyond the wall that says a Gentile can't go there uh, under penalty of death. Uh, so they were rioting, and then Paul uh, Paul uh, asked the uh, the Roman guard there if he can speak to the people. And he, they quiet them down, and it says he spoke in Hebrew. Well, he probably spoke in Aramaic. It's probably it was Aramaic. Okay. But he would have known Hebrew because of reading the Hebrew in in the Bible. So his... And he also probably spoke Greek, and he probably also knew Latin. So Paul really? was probably, he, huh. I'm sure he knew Latin to some extent uh, because of the Roman influence, because the Roman soldiers would have known Latin and also Greek. So uh, being multilingual was not a was not an uncommon thing. Interesting. Uh, and the um, <clears throat> the Latin speaking world eventually became what we now know as Western civilization. Western right. The Romance the, the, languages. The the in the in the Roman Church or yep. the Catholic Church. Yes. And then the Eastern side mm -hmm. would be those from uh, Byzantium mm -hmm. or Constantinople. Yes. And they spoke Greek. Yeah. From and there's a lot of division east. between Eastern Orthodox. And Roman Catholic comes from those differences, both culturally yep. and linguistically, That's if right. I understand correctly. That's right. Yeah. So, for example, Portuguese, Spanish, French, and Italian all come from Latin. Okay. So how old is Latin? I didn't know it... Uh, well, it goes... I don't know, but it goes way back uh, before Christ. Was that the common language that all of the Roman Empire used? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Now that makes sense. Well, Greek was the lingua franca, as they say, um... Greek would have come before? Yeah, because of the conquest of Alexander the Great yeah. in 300-some B.C., he spread the Greek language throughout the Mediterranean world. But in Italy, in Rome, the parliament, the, what we call the parliament, the senate, uh, they used Latin. So Latin came from the Roman Empire in Rome, in, in, in Italy. That's where Latin came from. Huh. So, uh, But the common people throughout the empire would have spoken Koine Greek, okay. Which is why the New Testament is written in Koine Greek, right? Because in in order for that to happen, in order for people to understand it, it would have had to have been spo uh, written in the language that they spoke. Uh, but huh. many of them were probably bilingual, at least. Uh, but of course, since the Roman Catholic Church uh, came from Rome, obviously, and they Latin was spoken there and used there then Latin became the language of the church, the Western church. And that's why you had the Latin Vulgate, uh, the Bible translated into Latin, yeah. which was the common vulgar. Vulgate comes from vulgar. Vulgar simply means common. Okay. It doesn't so, really mean what we think of it today. Well, it, it being motated gross. into that. It yeah. moved into that yeah. idea of vulgar being common and then common going to really low. You know, like right. being vulgar. Huh. But the Latin Vulgate translated by Jerome uh, in uh, the 4th century, 5th century. I can't remember exactly when. My dates are a little fuzzy there. But because the Western people used Latin in the church. And so, and then, that, of course, that became a big controversy later on with Wycliffe and Tyndale and all these folks who wanted to translate the Bible into the language of English or whatever. Yeah, German. And and by that time Latin had become, you know, what what I said in the last um in the last video about the language of uh, or the law of prayer is the law of faith, since the Latin had been used in the Bible all those years, then when somebody wants to translate it into something else, there's a big uproar. Oh no, this is God's language. We can't, you know, huh. we can't translate it into something else. But it had to get translated into yeah, that to begin well, with. Well, exactly. Yeah. So, so anyway, that's just a kind of a brief thing. So, so what we have is is the Hebrew Bible used by the earliest Christians who were Jewish. But then, but then you have um, you have 
uh, New Testament books, what we call the New Testament, which were written to be read by people who were not Jews necessarily, or who were Jews but lived in the wider empire. Right, which was who, largely Greek. Yes, who spoke Greek as their primary language. And so you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, all the way through Revelation, all written in Greek. And it's and it's specifically <clears throat> Koine Greek, or is that yeah, not really a difference? Yeah, there was a, a classical Greek, it's called, okay. which comes from the classical period in, in, in Greece. Which was earlier. Which would be like the time of Plato, yeah. even before Plato, Aristotle, um, that it would be that the Greek of the classical period from 500 BC, 400 BC, 300 BC in that, in, in that uh, area. So uh, that was classical Greek. And if you, if you know Greek at all or, or if you study Greek, um, it, it's different. It, it, it is different. Though, I mean, it's the same letters, a lot of the same words, but uh, if, if you just read the New Testament, and then you try to read this stuff, uh, you need a dictionary a lot more often. Okay. It, it, um, you know, the, uh, is there it's a, just different. Is there a development <clears throat> where you can see <clears throat> elements of the Greek language that turn into Latin, or are they completely separate? No, they're separate languages. Um, you know, there's probably, I'm not a linguist per se, but they're... There's always loan words and things like that. We we have them in English too. The only reason I, I uh, when I studied but, art history in college before I dropped out, mm -hmm. the the Greek everything came first. The Romans copied it and then built on it and actually improved upon it. So I wondered if the same thing took place with the language. Yeah, well, maybe not. of course, Alexander the Great was 320 BC when he died, somewhere around in there. Uh, so Greek was, and the Greek city-states, of course, preceded the Roman Empire. Right. Um, so they were much older than the Roman Empire came along later. Um, and I, you would have to consult a, a linguistic source to find out, you know, what the progression is from one language to another. That's fine. I'm just but, curious. Uh, I, I don't know the answer yeah. to that question. Um, so, so when we get to the New Testament books, then. Um, they were written in, in, in this common Greek. Uh, it's interesting that in the early days of people studying, uh, studying this Greek, because mostly classical scholars who knew classical Greek and had learned it in universities like Oxford and Cambridge yeah. and all of this, and they, they knew classical Greek from the philosophers back in the heyday of Greek civilization. And they came across the New Testament Greek, and they said, oh, this is different. So in the beginning, uh, some of the, those who were Christians called it Holy Ghost Greek. Oh, really? Yes. They thought, well, this is different, so this must be God's Greek. Right. Because it's in the New Testament. Yeah. But then as they did more work on it, they discovered, uh, you know, papyri, they discovered... Uh, inscriptions on pottery and all kinds of things, yeah. schoolboy exercises, huh. all of these common kinds of things. And they began to realize that this was just the Greek that the common people used in everyday life. Which we now call Koine Greek. Yes, Koine okay. just means common. Yeah. That's, that's okay. what it means. Interesting. Similar to Vulgate in Latin. It right. It just, just means common. Huh. So, uh, and, and the Greek of the New Testament varies from book to book. Uh, for example, Luke is very erudite Greek. He was a doctor. Yes. John is very simple compared mm -hmm. to Luke. Hebrews is a little more difficult. Revelation is kind of... Um, the book of Revelation sort of uh, seems to demonstrate a person whose primary language was not Greek, hmm. but who knows it pretty well and, and kind of thinks in another language. Interesting. But writes... Greek. Because he's choosing to do so to yeah, reach the so, audience. So it's a little bit weird in places. Yeah. Um, like when, when he talks about um, God being the one who is, who was, and who is to come. He, he says, the one who is, and then it says, the he was, and then the one to come. Huh. So it just... The he was. Yeah, the he was. Yeah. Just flipped him. Yeah, the he was. 
<laughs> now that may have been intentional for some reason, but uh, huh. but it's just weird. I mean, well, from what so, I understand about uh, the translation of language, you know, we tend to think if if and I'm I'm not a linguist. I had a really great conversation with one of the translators of that EHV um, Bible about five, six, seven years ago, and I think people have this misunderstanding that. There's a word for this in one language, and that same word means this in another language, and sometimes it's just not that simple. Mm. There are words that don't have an equivalent word in another language, so you That's have right. to try to take pre-existing words and try to move them around and make it work as good as you can, yeah. but it's never a precise scientific sort of a thing. There's a little bit of interpretation going on mm -hmm. in the process right. of translating from one completely different language yep. to another. And and Greek can say things that we can't say in English. That's what I've. That's what I've. You know, and I, and I don't know. For Greek, example, there there are verb tenses like Greek has what's called the imperfect tense. And the imperfect tense, for example, the imperfect tense is used in John one. In the beginning was the word. Okay. Now we can't, we we can't say that in English. And do justice to it by just saying was. Because it sounds like it happened. Because in the past. was to us is past, mm -hmm. but what that what that word, it's it's the Greek word ain, adenu. And so, in the beginning, was the word. We would have to say. In the beginning, the word always existed, or something like that. Which is the meaning in, of the whole verse. Yeah, in order to get that flavor. But but, but even huh. then, it's not quite the same. Yeah. So when a Greek reader reads that, he understands, and he has a picture, he has an understanding right away of what that's trying to say. In English, it's very difficult to yeah. communicate that same idea, because we don't have that kind of verb tense. And that's why when um, people say, I want a literal translation, mm, it's like, mm, well... There really isn't a literal translation because some yeah. words just don't have another word that's the exact, that's exact right. same word. So, so any translation is both an art and a science. It's a science, but it's also an art. And obviously, there is a spectrum where mm -hmm. they're getting much closer, yep. and they're using as many equivalent words as they can before they right. get to the place where they have to substitute a word that's close, but right. no such word exists. The other side would be when you're like just totally taking the meaning and just... <laughs> going well, off on these weird yes, tangents. Yes. You know, and, and you know, Eugene Peterson, who did the message, from what I understand, he did not intend his paraphrase to become what it is today. People actually use it as if it were a translation. Yeah. And I, I think he was a sincere guy who was just trying to write a version of the Bible that would be a secondary usage sort of a thing. Yeah. That would occasionally be of, of value. Mm -hmm. But he never wanted people to take that and claim it was the actual scriptures. Well, and he actually, my understanding is, he actually he actually had some knowledge of the languages. Whereas I think so. the fellow that did this Passion oh, Translation, he's an idiot. He claimed that Can God, I just say that on YouTube? He's God an idiot. gave him downloads yeah. and stuff, so he, no. he doesn't even claim to know the biblical languages. So if you, if you can't even know them well enough to at least use a dictionary to look up words and, and use uh, word studies to at least figure them out, if you don't at least do that much... I mean, you can't just you can't just look at it and just reword it however you want. But this also goes to the uh, thing I was just saying. <clears throat> Even if you could look up an individual word and you had a Greek Bible, right. which anybody can get, sure, you have to understand the way those words work together because they right. don't fit together the way our words fit together. That's right. So, and I I actually really love the English language, but I didn't do really well. <laughs> in English class, because I couldn't remember, you know, the verbs and the adverbs okay. and the adjectives. It, okay. It gets it gets um, yeah. jumbled up in my head pretty quickly. Yeah. So I think I would be a bad student of Greek. It, oh. would, it would be well, hard. Uh, I had a New Testament professor that actually made us diagram sentences in Greek. So I've seen uh, um, it, the the um, <clears throat> the guy um, uh, Rob Junior Rob. Robert Bowman Jr. Okay. You remember that name? Does that ring a bell? He's written a number of Not, books. No, no. Uh, the, the book that he wrote in 2001 on the word faith movement. It's called The Word Faith Controversy. Mm -hmm. It's the best book, and it's out of print, and I've been promoting it for the last seven okay. or eight years, and now they're like 50 bucks a piece if you can find them used. But he did that very thing. He actually maps out some of the verses mm -hmm. to show you the words have to go in a direction. You can't just rearrange yeah. them willy-nilly no. because 
maybe it might work in English, but it can't work in Greek in certain situations. Yep. One of the things, you know, if you if you read the old King James, you know, the the original one, not the new updated, not the new King James, you will find some rather wooden word orders. Yeah. And the reason why that's in there, uh, particularly in the New Testament, is because the word order in Greek is different than it would normally be in English. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the King James translators just left it that way. They translated it and left that kind of odd word order. Because they were trying to be faithful. Yeah, they were trying to be faithful to the text. But in, in, in actuality, if they had just reversed it enough to make it easy to understand, it wouldn't have changed the meaning at all. No, yeah. no. That's interesting. So, so that's, but if, if you have an old King James and you read it, I think you'll, you'll discover some word orders that sound a little odd in English. Well, in some uh, of the, but that's if you get to the really old printings, even the letters are different. Right. Before right. the English letters were developed yeah, to where they yeah, are today. So yeah. we don't want to go that far back. No, no. <laughs> so uh, you were asking, so I didn't get quite this far. I'm so sorry. in that terms was, that of was a tangent. In terms it? of the Old Testament, basically the original Christians just took over the Hebrew Bible, and uh, it's it's what the books that we have in the Old Testament today. That was the Hebrew Bible. And it had it had come to be understood as the inspired word of God yeah. up to the time of Christ, and they just used that. That's what they used. Whether it was the Hebrew one or whether it was the Greek translation, which is a little bit different. In obviously, it's a translation, so mm -hmm. and all translations are a little bit subjective and change things. So when we get to the New Testament, then we have a little bit different story because because we have. Uh, Probably the the only books, okay, the only books in the New Testament that were probably written for publication and distribution, as we would think of a book today, would be the four Gospels, the book of Acts, hmm. and maybe the book of Revelation. In other words, the writers knew this wasn't just going to one church or one yeah, group. They were writing it for... The we're gonna wider Christian audience for, for all time's sake to tell hopefully. you know the story of Jesus, what, uh, what his life, his crucifixion, his resurrection, yeah. uh, uh, the spread of the gospel, as in the case of Acts. I mean, Luke mm -hmm. makes it very clear the prelude to Luke, the prelude of Acts. This is a literary work. Now, when we come to the letters, we come to the letters of Paul, and the reason they're in that order is because of importance and size. So you have Romans, uh, maybe the largest one, certainly the most important, we would say, of his theological writings. Then First and Second Corinthians, which are the next largest. Then you have, you know, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, yeah. which are kind of all the same size yeah. next. And then you have, uh, you know, First and Thess Second Thessalonians. And then you have the letters that go to individuals, First and Second Timothy and Titus. Yeah. And then you have the little short one chapter Philemon. Right. So that becomes the, we would say, the corpus of Paul, the body of work of Paul. But those were occasional letters. And uh, letters were written to a specific person or group mm -hmm. at a specific time for a specific purpose. And I don't, I don't, you know, you can't tell that, but I would guess that Paul was not thinking, this is scripture. I, I, I don't think he was thinking that. He, he was thinking he's an apostle, he has authority from Christ, mm -hmm. and he's writing these authoritative letters to these churches and individuals to correct things, to explain things, and, and I think that's what those were. So for those to be copied would have been a second step. So uh, when you write something like, the Gospels, like Luke and Acts, maybe Revelation, where you understand that this is for a wider audience and it's to be published, copied, and distributed. That's one thing. But when Paul writes these letters, he's writing the Corinthian letters to the Corinthian church. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know that he was necessarily expecting that they were going to copy this and distribute it everywhere, and it was going to become part of, part of our Bible. Yeah. I don't necessarily think that he, he knew that. And then, of course, you have the general epistles, as we call them. Uh, well, you have Hebrews, which in the earlier days was attributed to Paul. Some people still do. Mm -hmm. We don't know who wrote it right. uh, for sure. Could have been Paul. 
although stylistically and grammar wise it's it's a lot different than Paul from what we know of Paul and then you have James first and second Peter uh, first and second third John Jude so then you have those are called general epistles because we don't really know who they were written to huh. I mean uh, you know Peter talks about writing to the dispersion whatever that is, whatever that means, the 12 tribes dispersed abroad, greetings. Yeah. Okay. Um, and James doesn't really say who it's addressed to. Uh, one of the letters of John talks about uh, Gaius, or Gaius. Yeah. Uh, we don't really know who he was. Interesting, yeah. Um, and Jude uh, doesn't really say who it's to. So so you have these these general letters, and then, of course, you have... The book of Revelation, which in Greek is titled, you know, the Apocalypse or Apocalypsis, which just means taking the veil off. So it's to be, that's where Revelation comes from. I was going to say, uh, in <clears throat> terms of uh, looking at the Bible from an apologetic standpoint, everything I understand about ancient religions is that they were written kind of as stories that were fanciful and mm -hmm. imaginative. And obviously, not based on real events. A lot of times that's true, yes. So, so for example, all the Hindu uh, religion is based on philosophy and ideas, but not necessarily anything historical. And that's what really sets mm. Christianity apart. Yes. And, you know, and going back to Andy Stanley, I think he, he, he knows that. I don't think he's nearly as well-read as he pretends to be. I think he's mm. a bit of a... Poser, you know, in terms of being a yeah, real historian. I don't know. I know he, he has a seminary degree, but I... Yeah. The, the things he said about mm. the Bible, how we didn't have the Bible until 400 years later, it's like, yeah, well, we had all the books of the Bible, you knucklehead. Yeah. They weren't stuck together in what we call the Bible, but we had the books. Yeah. But but uh, they're mm. all written... They're not, they're not telling these fanciful stories, and, and, no. and they're certainly not written by people who are promoting themselves. All of the writers are exposing themselves as sinners. And, yep. they're, and they're exalting right. the one guy who never wrote a book. Mm -hmm. So Jesus didn't write any books. He gives that authority to the apostles, and the apostles do this amazing job of pointing continually to what Christ has done and not to themselves and to their mm -hmm. own glory, which doesn't happen in human history. Human, That's right. Human uh, uh, beings are known for bragging on themselves and puffing themselves up and building their own worldly kingdoms. As my folks used to say, we toot our own horn. Yes, we toot our own horn. <laughs> and Christianity is so, so distinct. That's, I mean, yep. if, if mm. you get nothing else from this video, it's a, it's a historical group of writings that were written by real people in real time and That's space right. about real events that even if you don't believe them, they believed it. They were writing about stuff mm. they truly believed mm -hmm. took place. And they yep. all, almost all of them gave their lives they didn't want to back down from what they saw and witnessed. Yep. So, yeah, it's a it's a very strong case for Christianity being distinct yep. from all other religions. Well, if you compare, okay, we can we need to talk more about the subject of how we got the New Testament. Yeah. And dispel some of the myths that are out there, like we didn't have the New Testament till 400 years or something after Christ, which is completely and totally false. So the Old Testament was written over a period of approximately a thousand years. So if you go back to the time of Moses and you end at roughly 400, 450 B.C., yeah. it's about a 1,000 years. So uh, the Old Testament was written within that period of time. And then you have the 450 or 400-year gap when there were no prophetic books written. Then you have the coming of Christ. So the New Testament was written within, and there's some dispute on this. If, if you go with the traditional view, the Revelation was probably the last one written during the during the reign of the Roman Emperor Domitian, which was in the 90s, AD mm -hmm. 90, 95. Then you have a period of about, let's say the first New Testament book was written maybe in 40-some 50, AD 50. Yeah, that's you got 40, read. 50 years. Within that span of time, mm -hmm. these books were written. Now, if you, if you come into contact with liberal scholarship, uh, they will put some of the books like the Letters of Peter, uh, some of that, uh, they will say, well, that was written in the second century. You know, they'll do that type of thing. However, um, what is what is true is that by by sometime in the second century, 
we basically have the churches using, quoting, uh, preaching on uh, most of the books that now are in our New Testament. Hmm. Now, they didn't officially come out and say necessarily, this is our Bible. Right. The first time that anybody actually put out a list of all the books that we currently have was a church father by the name of Athanasius who every every year wrote an Easter letter to his uh, bishopric. He was a bishop. And in 367 at Easter, he wrote a letter. And in that letter, he had the list of all the books we currently have. And that's the first time we know huh. of where the list was actually given for right. sure. Right. However, uh, I have a quote here from a, uh, where did I have that, from a, a late 2nd century, early 3rd century church father by the name of Irenaeus. And Irenaeus was a disciple of a man named Polycarp. Who was a disciple of Polycarp, Paul? Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John. Oh, John. Yes. I almost had it. I remember hearing that. So just here's what Irenaeus said, and Irenaeus lived from 130 to 202. So to give a, a little bit of uh, context, we think the Apostle John lived the longest, and yep. he lived into the 90s yep. when he wrote Revelation. Yep, towards so, the end of the so century. This, this would be just one generation later. Yes. He could be like John's grandson. He could be. Something like that. So this is this is late second century, like 150 years after the crucifixion. Okay, so uh, here's what Irenaeus said. He said that it's appropriate that we have four Gospels. Okay, hmm. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So he's not including the Gospel of Thomas or any of this stuff. Yeah. Because the earth had four zones where people lived, there were four winds. He also related the number four to the four creatures around God's throne in Revelation and their similar predecessors in Ezekiel. Now, of course, this sounds a little fanciful, and it is fanciful, but, but he's, he's making the point, first of all, that there are four and only four Gospels. Yeah, interesting. The ones we have today. Yeah. And this is, you know, 150 years after Jesus, basically, uh, somewhere in that, in that vicinity. So, uh, and Justin Martyr, a second century apologist who lived from 100 to 165, wrote that in the Sunday services, the memoirs of the apostles were read. And by that, he probably meant the Gospels. Hmm. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's what he called the memoirs of the apostles. Now, it's interesting because they put what they called the Gospel book, they put in the center of the congregation. And uh, they read it from there. Not in the front, but in the middle. In the middle of the room. Yes. So it's interesting that in huh. the church I belong to, Calvary Lutheran in Elgin, when, when the gospel reading takes place, the pastor picks up the, the book, he walks down the aisle to the middle, huh. we all turn and face him, and he reads the gospel. Interesting. Yeah. So this is a custom that's been going on for... A long time. 1,900 years. Wow. Okay. And maybe from the beginning. Okay. So... So some of these customs are still in existence today and have been. So, so this just shows that anybody who says, well, these, you know, they, didn't, they didn't know what books were in the Bible until Constantine or until the Catholic Church right. came along. Right. This is all nonsense. It is. Um, yes, it is true that it was in some senses a gradual process. There were some books of our New Testament that were under some question. Uh, the book of Revelation, because it's weird, probably. Uh, but then there's weird stuff in Daniel. Mm -hmm. And there's weird stuff in Ezekiel. I mean, if you, haven't, if you haven't read Ezekiel, read Ezekiel. Talk about weird. I mean, there's some yeah. weird stuff in there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you got wheels in the air, and you got dry bones. And yeah. You got all this stuff. So you sound like Johnny Carson. Yeah. There's some weird, wild stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah. So what I was gonna do was this. So we had the Hebrew Bible. Now, 
when the church when the church was saying okay what writings what writings are really of God okay so what they did is they said well first of all they have to have they have to have the either come directly from an apostle or in some sense indirectly from an apostle so for example um, Luke was an associate of Paul Mark was thought to have gotten his information directly from Peter yeah because Mark wasn't an apostle no. himself and neither was Luke yeah but they were right there with him right and Paul excuse me Paul of course was an apostle 13th apostle he was specifically called and chosen by Christ converted by Christ himself I mean I think for <clears throat> added clarity just to make the point that it wasn't a normal thing for people to write books like this. No. When they decided, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write this, it was a really, like, once-in-a-lifetime event. That So if you think about writing letters today, or especially maybe mm -hmm. just a generation ago before the Internet, or even an email, mm -hmm. it's so common yes. that the language is describing what appears to be the same thing, but it's not the same thing. Yep. So when the books of the Bible were written... It really held a lot of weight. Yes. And, and and just to kind of grab a hold of that, I think is is useful. Yeah. Because you know, like I said, you know, people write books all the time now. Everybody sure. and his brother's got a book. Sure. You can self-publish books now. It, it's almost meaningless to well, have a book a anymore. Well, a lot of people were illiterate. I mean, they yeah. they might have spoken two or three languages. They couldn't read and write. So hmm. that was true of a lot of people back then. Not of everyone. I mean, there was literacy. But they were they um, were tr they were transferring ideas verbally sure. much more than writing. So yeah. to take the time to write, may maybe is something you would do after twenty years of talking about that thing. You're mm -hmm. like, well, I think maybe yeah. it's time I actually wrote this down. Yeah. And that's why we see these books being written starting in the late '40s, early '50s, not you know, twenty weeks after the the resurrection. It it it, right. it took a, a while because they were just used to verbally communicating everything sure. all the time. And there's even yeah. Uh, the idea that in that culture people had the ability to retain information much better than we do today because they weren't dependent on reading. That's right. They, they had to. Yeah. So the normal the normal way that, a, let's say, a rabbi or a teacher would operate, he would gather about him a group of disciples and he would repetitively teach them and they would be asked to repeat it back. And right. so, which is a great way to memorize. And so, you know, you have liberal scholarship, which goes back, you know, a couple of centuries, saying, well, you know, um, these sayings of Jesus, they were just, some of them were just kind of added to by the church and all. They, they, they didn't understand, again, this is part of the cultural context. Things were different. You know, we, we, uh, well, when I was growing up, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have email, we didn't have all of that. So we relied on the newspaper uh, and so on, the TV. We got our information that way, uh, and we didn't we didn't remember it. We didn't memorizing was hard. Right. Anybody that's I remember sitting down with my history book, remember memorizing dates mm -hmm. and what happened and so on. But in that culture. Partly because of illiteracy and partly because just how uh, a teacher and his disciples operated. If you were going to be like your teacher, you regurgitated the same things that he taught you. You memorized these things. You remembered them. The use of fruit. Mm. Yes. The fruit of the teacher should look like the teacher. Sure. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the fruit is, uh, he's got 10,000 people going yep. to his church. He's got good fruit. Yep. No, it's no. His teachings sound like the same things yes. that the teacher taught. So when these apostles and their associates uh, wrote down what Jesus said, maybe they wrote it down 20 years after he said it, it wasn't because they made it up. Right. Like we might think of today. Well, how can you remember what so-and-so said 20 years ago? They memorize this stuff. And they've been repeating it over and, and over. And they've been again. repeating it yeah. and teaching it. So so it had to come from an apostle. The second thing <coughs> is it had to agree with doctrine. In other words, the apostles had taught and preached and proclaimed who Jesus was, uh, the scriptures that talked about him, 
uh, what uh, what Jesus had done for us, that he, he came, he was incarnate, he was born of the Virgin Mary, um, conceived by the Holy Spirit, all the things we find in the creeds. So it had to agree in doctrine. So if you had, let's say you had 15 writings that pretty much agreed in, in teaching and doctrine and belief, and then you had this one out here that was off. Okay? Yeah. So that one is probably going to be rejected because it, it doesn't... And then the other thing is uh, use in the church. Which goes right along with if the doctrine was a little bit off, they weren't going to use it in the church. Yes. So it just kind of faded out. Yeah. And all the good stuff stayed yeah. and kind of rose to the top. Right. So, so these were kind of the three criteria that were used hmm. uh, by, by the early church to kind of test... Because there was a period of, of testing, uh, on not not all of the writings, but but some were in question for a time, but ultimately this this is is the test. So when when you get to I uh, mentioned the church father Irenaeus, the end of the second century, who uh, commented on the four gospels, and he wrote a he wrote a work called Against Heresies. Yeah, I've got that on my shelf. Up and he was writing against what's called the Gnostic heresy. Mm -hmm. And they used the New Testament too. Their favorite book was John because of how spiritual it is and they could use things in there to make it sound Gnostic. Hmm. And so there's a question then, okay, who's, who's got the right interpretation of, the, of John or yeah. of anything? Yeah. And Irenaeus said, well, we do because we have the rule of faith. So the rule of faith would be something like creedal statements that say... Because the question really was about who is Jesus, who is God, yeah. the things that appear in the creeds. I believe in God the Father Almighty, uh, you know, and uh, maker of heaven and earth, mm -hmm. and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was, born, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, and so on, suffered on a Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. So, so if you go through the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, particularly those two, uh, you, you see what he was talking about. We have a guide, and our guide is the teaching of the apostles that's come down to us, and we have this rule of faith. And if it departs from that, it's false. So he used uh, that phrase, rule of faith? Yes, we have the rule of faith. Huh. So that's what he meant by that. So, uh, so there is a, a way of, and this would be basically doctrine, uh, so people that say today, well, we don't need doctrine. We just need experience. We just right. need, okay, but 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 this is really false because if you don't have doctrine, you drift. Yeah, and and that's what's happening in the church today, is that Big you time. have this de-emphasis on doctrine, and an emphasis on works on. On deeds, mm -hmm. on experience. Deeds, not creeds. Yes, that's right. That's a saying of Rick Warren, I think, said that. Which he got and, it from the pietists. And other people. Yeah. But So if you go that route, then you lose your, your grounding, you mm -hmm. lose your foundation, and you no longer have this rule of faith to guide you, particularly in the basics of who Jesus is, who God is, right. and so on, which is, is, and what the church is, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, I mean, God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Those are the three parts of the creed. That also leads to, mm -hmm. I think it's a big part of why we see uh, this progressive um, movement that actually ends up with people just abandoning Christianity altogether. Because mm -hmm. you say, well, you know, doctrine isn't that important. It's more important that we live, you know, good moral lives and we do mm -hmm. good things and we love each other and we show acceptance to everybody. Yep. And you keep going down that road. Well... You want to just love everybody and you just want to show acceptance to everybody? Mm -hmm. It's much easier to do that when you get rid of all your doctrine. Yep. You eventually get to the point where you say, well, I don't really need a crucified Christ. Mm -hmm. I, I yep. can just be a nice person and do good deeds and enjoy my life and do whatever the heck I want. Yep. Well, you know, what, what right doctrine does is, you know, you've titled this thing, God, God in a Box, yeah. question mark. Okay? Yeah. And at the beginning I drew this... I drew this little little sketch of a, uh, I'm not a very good artist, unfortunately. No, not very good, but anyway, 
Yeah, I could draw the Bible for you yeah. if you wanted. So there's there's my somewhat idealized Bible. And um, okay, so we have pages here. And then I put it in a box. And the reason I put it in a box, and so we're talking about the Bible as being, you know, really the Bible is for the most part doctrine. And doctrine includes and this is where we have to be careful. Doctrine includes not only theological facts, but also moral imperatives. Mm -hmm. It includes all of those. Mm -hmm. So right doctrine includes the Ten Commandments, as well as the information about who God is, mm -hmm. who Jesus is, uh, about the world in which we live, about sin, the nature of man. It includes all of that. So, so if you say, well, doctrine doesn't matter, all we need is uh, to live right, to uh, have experiences. Which is a doctrine then in and of itself. It is. One. Then, then, what we, then we can go anywhere. Right. Because you have people that claim all kinds of experiences. Yeah. You have all these people out there, a number of them, if you've watched Steve or or Long for Truth, or, mm -hmm. or uh, Chris Roseboro, uh, you've encountered these folks who claim to have been to heaven many times. <laughs> and they come back with all this, yeah. all this stuff. Okay, well, you know, once, once you go that route, you, you can say anything. Because you really can. you're talking to people, you're saying, I have this experience, while the people out there don't have this experience, probably, I'm, I'm guessing. Until they go out and start their own little cult. Yeah, so... So then, if you get away from doctrine, if you get away from, from scriptural teaching, yeah. and, and which includes 2,000 years of history of interpreting it, mm -hmm. um, then all bets are off. Um, you can have anything. You have a big mess. That's what we have in the church today. We have a big mess. So uh, is God in a box? Yes, in this sense he is. It's the box that he created um, for himself. Yep. It, you know... It's just so simple. I'm, uh, going back to, you know, how I was saying 10, 12 years ago, I was trying to figure stuff out, and I, I had a handful of things in a short period of time that kind of put me on this path. And one of them was just, you know, Christians all claim to be Bible-believing Christians. Yes. Nobody says, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe the Bible. <laughs> no, no. I don't bother with that. That, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't make any Very sense. Very few people would yeah. say that. Yeah. Some actually do do that, but yes. they don't admit to no, it. No, no. And so I just kept thinking, well, why don't we just go back to that then? Why don't we try to make, you know, at least for myself, I was thinking I, I want to try to be more of a Bible-based Christian. I want to look into the Bible for myself. And, you know, uh, if something I hear in church doesn't, come from the Bible or agree with the Bible, then I'm free to reject that thing. Mm -hmm. And so that was so fundamental. But if you start with the idea that being a Christian is all about having a personal relationship with Jesus, which is kind of true and kind of not true, depending on yeah, how you define I mean, there, all those words. There's truth in it, but... Right. It's too ambiguous to really mean anything in yeah, particular. It, it's, too, it's too modern mushy. So, um, but but if, you, if that's a starting point, yeah. Well, I think Jesus is this, this, and this, and I talk to him, and I'm pretty sure he talks back to me. So, hey, leave me alone. Right, I've exactly. got my own personal version of Christianity, and how sure. dare you question that? Sure, it's just very subjective. Very, uh, you know, people are making stuff up, and it's no longer Christianity anymore. And it's actually weird because it's this mysticism that actually combines with or is another version of postmodernism where ultimately you have nothing that's totally true anymore mm -hmm. with the only thing you know for sure is that you don't know anything for sure <laughs> which is postmodernism kind of in a nutshell well mysticism is really in in one sense it's a disconnection from reality from created reality from the world from around the physical you. reality right so it's it's an attempt Basically, mysticism is an attempt to have a direct connection with uh, the divine, whatever that is to you, uh, whether it's the Christian God or Hindu or whatever. It's to have a direct connection unmediated. So that, that can only happen if you somehow 
shut out, get rid of, put aside the physical, the material world, including your own body. So, so that's the only way that can happen. Now, the thing about Christianity, biblical Christianity, is grounded in the physical and the material. Yeah, that's what that's what the incarnation is about. Yeah, the logos became sarks, flesh. Okay, now you got to do a little Greek there for yeah, us. Sarks means flesh. Okay, we get the word sarcophagus from that, huh. meaning a place for a dead yeah. body to be. Yeah. So yeah, so we we get the so the word became flesh. Can you um, help us understand that mm. word logos or logos? Is it yes. sometimes pronounced? Yeah, it's. Yeah, it's it's the it's the Omicron, so it's the shorter O, but they may have pronounced it very similar to Omega, which is a longer O. We don't really know. Okay. Maybe some people know. I'm I'm not real sure. If you learn Greek to distinguish them, they'll teach you to pronounce it Logos, and they'll teach you to pronounce the Omega as O. But uh, whether that was really the way it worked or not, I don't know. Yeah, the word Logos, if if you research it. It has a whole range of meanings. So in, in the original, let's say, classical Greek period, it had to do with, well, with human reason, but also connected with the reason of the universe, the divine reason, hmm. the uh, what was behind everything, that kind of a concept. So Was it inherently a term that was opposed mm. to Gnosticism? Or am I wrong there? Well... I, I don't know that, I don't I don't know that, because uh, Gnosticism is really a later thing. Okay. Um, so so I'm not sure. But but that's what it would be. Now now the the Jewish people could even use it to refer to the law to the Torah. The logos of God. Okay. So they could even use it in that way. Hmm. And then of of course. When you get into Gnosticism, they could use it to be, well, the, let's say the Stoics, they might use it. Stoicism was a philosophy that was fatalistic and basically believed that there was no free will whatsoever, that you're just dragged along by the fates and hmm. the best thing you could do was go along with everything and that's how you'd be happy. So for them, it could be like, the divine soul, the soul of the universe, hmm. um, this kind of concept that's almost, almost pantheistic in a way, where where God and 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 the universe are the, kind of the same thing. It's a more impersonal. God, yeah, very sure. impersonal kind of a thing. And for a Gnostic, I suppose it could be that spark of the divine that would be in you, that was put there by, by the highest God. Yeah, the true God. So when you discover the spark of the divine, that's why they liked the the Gospel of John because they could kind of use these ideas huh. to. Uh, they liked the Gospel of John, is my understanding. Um, so so it could be that. Now, when John writes about it, like when the very first yeah. Now he the word became flesh. Yeah. So so he's addressing a couple of audiences in his gospel. It seems fairly clear. Because he does explain some Jewish terminology, which he wouldn't have to do if he's only writing with Jews in mind, because they would already know. He has to explain that Samaritans and Jews don't have anything to do with each other, which they wouldn't have to explain if he's writing, because yeah. they would already know. So he does he does explain a number of things like that. Uh, so when he uses it, if he's addressing the Greeks, they're probably seeing it as this... Um, divine mind, this kind of um, rationality of reality of the universe, of whatever God is for them. Hmm. The Jewish person is going to think of it in terms of Yahweh, in terms yeah. of, of his law and his his thought and his mind. Uh, so so it has kind of a range of meanings, as I understand it, if, if, if you look at it that way. So, uh, but But then basically you're talking about revelation and and kind of how we know anything it's mm -hmm. like communication is involved in that so if you think of genesis 1 
and how God created everything, and God said, mm -hmm. and God said, yeah. and God said. So there you have a concept of God's word creating. God speaks that it is. Mm -hmm. So here is this Which is one. different than us speaking and creating, yeah, by the way. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> we don't have that power. No. Despite people who say we do. Yeah. Uh, so when he says that the Word, in the beginning was the Word, he's obviously, again, doing a takeoff of Genesis 1. Yeah. But this is a different beginning. This is a beginning beyond beginnings. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God prostontheon, which means face to face with God. And then he's he's doing a triad building up to a climax. Hmm. The word was God. So he's getting there. Hmm. Okay, so so he's now he's identifying he's identifying this concept which in the Greek mind would have been like divine reason or yeah. the soul of the universe or this concept of, of knowing and to the Jewish mind, maybe God's word, God's law, um, God's thoughts. And he's saying, okay, first of all, it was there from the beginning. It never began. It uses that Greek imperfect, which is, in, you know, which is indefinite past. And then, so first it was, then it was face to face with God. That's, that's a real step closer. And then finally is God, okay? So, and then he talks about how he created everything. Nothing was made without him. Mm -hmm. Nothing was made. So he goes on and on. And then pretty soon, he says this word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And we beheld his glory as the only God and the Father, full of grace and truth. So you get to John 1, 14. So the, the, that the, the whole idea is of Something which was thought of as being immaterial, and was immaterial in that sense, hmm. becoming human flesh. The Logos. Becoming human flesh. Yeah. And, and flesh is really, I mean, flesh is, you can't get anything more material than flesh. And flesh embodies all that we are as humans. You know, it embodies our body. Yeah. Uh, our urges, our, you know, everything. It's mm -hmm. all embodied in this idea of flesh. Um, and, you know, incarnation is from a Latin word, carne meaning flesh. And that's okay. used in Spanish to mean, I think, beef usually. Oh, yeah. 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 Chile con carne. Yeah, I've heard Chile that. with beef. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Yes. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Yes. This is. This is John saying, I'm not telling you some story that I heard from a guy yep. who heard it from a guy who heard it from a guy. <laughs> I saw this. Yes. This is so profound. So this is where, see, this would be the source. I mean, this this is getting really theological here, but but this would be the source. John 1.14, that whole passage, would really be the source of um, non-Gnostic religion. Mm-hmm. Of sacramental theology. Yeah, it's a physical thing. Sacramental theology is theology that says that there is God's word, there is God's grace tied up in material things. Right. And of course, there he says, what when he was enfleshed, he was full of grace and truth, right? So what is a sacrament? A sacrament is a means of grace. Grace. Right? So, so there you have the beginnings of sacramental theology. Hmm. So the tendency that we always have, and this is why, this is why people don't want to stick with the word. The tendency we have is to want to break out hmm. of, of that material restriction, that material reality, and we want to break out of that and we want to, in some sense, attain to God. And that's really the essence of the fall. That's the yeah. essence of the fall, where Satan's temptation was, you, you can be like God. Right. And there are word faith people today who preach that. Mm -hmm. Little God's theory. Mm -hmm. uh, you can create things with your words like God could. 
So here is that temptation. Yeah. And 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 it sounds good because this is our always temptation. This is this is our temptation that we want to do. It's like we, the Star Wars tapping into the dark side. Yeah, we don't want to be <laughs> we don't want to be confined to this world. We don't want to be confined to this flesh. We want to break out of it. We don't want to have we don't want to have something in a box. We we don't want that. We don't want that we don't want that confinement. Unfortunately, that is our confinement. That's where we are. We're fleshly people. Yeah. So the only reason, why would God send his son, his eternal word, into flesh? Because that's what we are. Mm -hmm. He is the creator of the material world. He is the creator of our bodies. He's the creator of everything fleshly. And so you see today in our society, this it, it's coming to a real... Uh, nadir, if if is that the right word or is that the bottom? Anyway, an apex, whatever, mm. it's coming to to the top of this whole concept. Where now you can escape your body by changing your gender. Oh, I'm not a man. I'm a woman now. And denying the reality of what your body really is. Yeah. And even butchering your body. To try to make an external display yeah. of what your idea is. And this is where we've come to. And it's hmm. because of this Gnostic, non-sacramental, non-incarnational... Non-physical. Non-physical thinking. And is, which has been with us forever. And it's a, it's, it's, a, it's been with us forever. It's a disconnection from God and a disconnection from physical reality. That's or, right. or a desire to disconnect That's right. from physical reality. And this is what we have in many of our churches today, uh, in America and other places, where since the belief is that God cannot come to us in anything material, He can't come to us in water, He can't come to us in bread and wine, Yeah. therefore we have to bring Him down... Right. In extended ecstatic worship of some kind. Yep. Or we have to go up to meet him in heaven uh, by, uh, let's say, the Reformed view of the Lord's Supper, where he can't be in the bread and wine. Oh, no, 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 he can't be there. Uh, but we can go up there. Yeah. So what is that except an escape from the body? Because hmm. our bodies can't go up there, right? We're here. So the people, you know, if you're if you're in a in a in a reformed church service and you're taking communion, all the people in the pews aren't disappearing. <laughs> They're yeah. still there, right? So so there's this concept of a mystical escape somewhere else, or this bringing of God down. So so what is that passage? Is that in Ephesians? Oh, I get there. Is that in Romans? Where I was right, it's in Romans 10. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or, Who will ascend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Okay, so the idea that, um, that Christ has already come, he's come near, and he's in the word. Now, word of faith there can mean a couple different things. It can mean it can mean the message of doctrine. It could mean that, because faith can also be the content of our faith as well as faith itself. Hmm. So it could be that. Um, it could be the word that announces that salvation is by faith. It could mean that. So it, it could be uh, mean a couple different things. The genitive case in Greek has to always be unpacked because um, it's not just like in English when we put an of, it usually means possessive, but that's not true in Greek. Okay. Uh, in fact, it's almost never true. Hmm. Um, so.
So so anyway, but I just thought of that because you know we can't we can't bring Christ down. We can't bring him up. Mm -hmm. It's already accomplished. So and and the word, you see, the word then is an incarnational thing. Mm -hmm. So when the pastor preaches the word on Sunday morning, that's an incarnational thing. Yeah, because those words come from a human being to human beings, but they're they're words from God, if He's preaching the word correctly, as He should. Um, so so this this whole concept. This concept of of sacramental theology and incarnational theology is so deep. I mean, you you can you can spend a lifetime reflecting on it hmm. and unpacking it. Um, it it's, uh, but but it really is the opposite of most of most of American Christianity. They give yeah. lip service to the incarnation of Christ, certainly, and I'm not saying they don't they're not believers. But they've made a kind of Gnosticism out of the faith. Right. It's not full blown Gnosticism. No, it's not. But it has elements. But it it of has it. elements of it. It's right. a, it's a it's a kind of spiritualization mm -hmm. of of what the the church in the earliest days uh, believed and taught. Yeah, you kind of get the picture that they think <clears throat> the early church were people who were just swaying back and forth and. No. getting themselves into a hypnotic mm. state so that they could have some sense of God's presence. Mm -hmm. And I think it, you know, again, going back to they were taking everything they had from the Jewish practices, which were very yeah. based on the word. And that whole idea that they were, they were used to memorizing entire batches of scripture. Yeah. I don't think they just threw all that away and said, let's just... Sit here and wait till we get a word from God. No, I mean probably the closest to that in the New Testament would be the Church of Corinth. Yeah. Which was kind of in a bit of chaos. Yeah. Because one of the things that, that Paul has to say to them is that God wants things done decently and in order. Mm -hmm. So uh, and and part of certainly a good part of his exhortation to them is you guys are out of order. Mm -hmm. And so they were a chaotic group right. to some extent. And uh, he was trying to uh, back them out of that. He was trying to look, you know, you can't, you can't just all be speaking in tongues at one time and, yeah, and, and going through all this stuff, and uh, and having rivalries among you as to who the greatest preacher is, and uh, so so obviously, the church at Corinth was a, probably the most problem problematic church that he had. As far as we know, based on yeah, the writings. That as we far as we know. Yeah. yeah, it was a mess. I mean, in Colossians, he certainly addresses, and Galatians, he addresses some major problems, but not quite on the level of of Corinth. He's talking more in Galatians about, you know, going back to the Jewish law and circumcision. Mm -hmm. Right. And in Colossians, he's talking more about a kind of Gnosticized uh, faith and, uh, you know, worshiping uh, days and, and uh, kind of a philosophical take on on certain things. And the Corinthian uh, church sounds exactly like uh, a, an out of line charismatic church it today. Does. Yeah, and it it it's so much about correcting. There's um, this is a side topic that we could get to in more detail about the whole issue of cessationism, but the the primary. There's only a couple of chapters that talk about the spiritual gifts, right. and it's right there, and it's That's it's right. largely about correcting practices <clears throat> that were way out of line. That's right. But when Paul's talking to other churches, he's not giving them instructions about how important it is to be receiving no. new utterances. No. He's not telling them, now remember, everybody get up there and have a word for each other. He's instead telling them to make sure you stick to sound doctrine. That's what he's telling Timothy, that's what he's telling Titus. That's right. Yeah. So he's... he's I, He's, there's this continuing need to go back to the box that God has put himself in in his in his word. And I think that's actually a really good place for us to stop for this one. And we got okay. hopefully enough time before you got to go back home. Maybe we can record another one. And we yeah. forgot to turn the timer on. I hope so. But I, but, I, but I think this has been about an hour. I think so. Okay. We're done for now. Goodbye. We, kind of, we meandered on, on a bunch of really good topics, but this was a really good discussion. Thanks, Daryl. See you in the next one. Yep. Boston! Boston!